National Public Radio presents a formal debate held recently at Cambridge University between feminist Germaine Greer and columnist William F. Buckley. Ms. Greer, an actress, journalist, professor of literature, and author of the bestseller, The Female Eunuch, spoke in favor of the Cambridge Union Debating Society motion that this house supports the women's liberation movement. Mr. Buckley, who also hosts the public broadcasting program Firing Line, heads the opposition. An audience vote taken at the conclusion of the program will indicate the winner of the debate. Good evening. My name is Roger Evans, an ex-president. We are here tonight at the Cambridge Union Society the world-famous debating society of Cambridge University. You will see around the walls of this chamber uh, pictures of English politicians for over 150 years who have held office in this society and later in life when they have become distinguished come back here to speak. Harold Wilson, I understand, spoke here only a week or so ago. But as well as famous English politicians, people like Lord Mountbatten and indeed the Prince of Wales have spoken here in debate. People like the Archbishop of Canterbury. We also in this house have a long tradition of distinguished American visitors. Indeed, Teddy Roosevelt himself spoke here some while ago. This evening, we have a debate between William Buckley Jr. and Germaine Greer. The president is Chris Smith, and he will be chairing the proceedings. Good evening and welcome ladies and gentlemen to the sixth debate of term. Tonight we are debating women's liberation. The motion before the house is this house supports the women's liberation movement. Our guest speakers tonight are Dr. Germaine Greer who will be speaking in favor of the motion and um, <laughs> and Mr. William F. Buckley, Jr., who will be speaking against the motion. Um, Mr. Buckley has debated twice at Cambridge before, um, once against James Baldwin when he lost, um, <laughs> once against J.K. Galbraith when he won, um, and tonight he is debating against Germaine Greer, who was herself a postgraduate at Cambridge. Um, Speaking first on Germaine's side will be Mr. Mark Goyder of Trinity College and speaking first on Mr. Buckley's side will be Mr. Stephen Alcock of Jesus College. I call on Mr. Mark Goyder of Trinity College to propose the motion. Mr. President, sir, my sister, who is an active women's liberationist in California, told me of a friend of hers who was uh, a Catholic and who was recently married, and uh, went to confession one day and said to the priest, Father, I've got this terrible feeling that I'm superior to my husband. <laughs> well, what, what should I do about it? And the priest said, my dear, you must go away and pray and ask, to, ask God for guidance. Oh, I've done that, she said, and, and she agrees. <laughs> In the absence tonight of uh, divine affirmation of the cause of women's liberation, we have Dr. Germaine Greer. <laughs> that most articulate amongst, amongst earthly prophets. Uh, to propose the motion. It's uh, anthropology I want to start on tonight, as a matter of fact, Mr. President, because I want to make two fundamental points about my support for the women's liberation movement. The first of them is to prove to my own mind that I think it's possible for, for women to change the status that they have in society at the moment. And the second point I'll be making is to show the kind of ways in which they're proposing to make this change. I think any reference to a dictionary of quotations would tell you 
that men have been expressing their contempt for women for centuries. I mean, I know you uh, may be a fan of Dr. Johnson's, Mr. President, in spite of his hatred for Scotsmen, but uh, <laughs> take his statement about women preachers, uh, present company, of course, excluded. Sir, a woman... <laughs> Sir, a woman preaching is like a dog walking on its hind legs. It's not done well, but the wonder is that it's done at all. <laughs> now, we're used to that kind of comment. We're used to the idea that men are contemptuous of the things that, 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 that women can't do nearly as well as men can do. But when groups start arising that suggest that women may have contempt for men, we feel much more threatened. Now, I don't know, Mr. President, if you're a member of SCUM, the society... <laughs> The society for on the, the on the grounds, Mr. Goido, that it always floats to the top. <laughs> on this occasion, at any rate, Mr. President, <laughs> the women's liberation movement doesn't seek to dictate to women who are quite happy as they are. It is articulating the discontent of women who are not happy as they are. It's saying to, it's representing the women who are sick of dependence upon men, who are sick of a situation which is justified because it's convenient as a specialization of responsibilities as far as society as a whole is concerned because it's a convenient division of labor as far as men are concerned for women to do the housework and for men to come home in the evening to a lovely warm meal, but which hasn't been considered in terms of its utility or its limitations or the frustration or the discontent that it implies for women. And now that the biological myths have been overthrown, Mr. President, the women's liberation movement is saying the future is in their own hands. The women's liberation movement is saying, no, I'm sorry, I'm nearly finishing now. The women's liberation movement is saying, we're looking forward to the time when we can alter Dr. Johnson's male chauvinist remark to the following. The sight of men preaching against women's liberation will indeed remind us of a dog walking on its hind legs. They won't be able to do it well but it'll be an amazing thing that they still manage to scrape up the sophistries to do it at all. I ask you to join me in supporting the women's liberation movement and to support this motion. I call on Mr. Stephen Alcock of Jesus College to speak against the motion. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, men and women, tonight we are in the presence of the world's most liberated lady, Dr. Germaine Greer, whose book has been reprinted no less than eight times, ladies and gentlemen, which must mean somebody is interested in female eunuchs. <laughs> now let's take a look at women's liberation movement in England today. It's a diffuse organization and it's very difficult to find out what it's actually standing for. It has no national policy as such. But I was lucky enough to get hold of a magazine called Enough. And <laughs> now, not everyone gets Enough, so... <laughs> and writing in this particular magazine are Miss Susie Fleming asks the question, what do we want? And she answers it as well, but you have to wait a long time and read a lot of the article to find out what she does want. Well, the point of information, sir, is that rather like your speech? <laughs> she says, it's impossible to answer briefly. There isn't a single demand you can trot out. Now, she's playing hard to get. And women's liberation women specialize in that. But she says more. 
traditional politics can't begin to deal with the sort of changes we're talking about. So now we're getting closer. And now she comes up with this particular little gem. The fact that women have been relegated to secondary roles in political activity has dangerous consequences in that it enables the ruling class to use a divide and rule policy against the working class. They've uncovered another conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen. The capitalist bourgeois ethic is at it again. They're suppressing women to keep an icy grip on the working classes. It's yet another capitalist plot, and we're not unfamiliar with plots in this society. <laughs> we're faced with a women's liberation movement whose concern for women is not their only concern. And remember, Mr. President, in this House tonight, we are debating the movement. We are not debating liberation for women. I quote from the magazine Socialist Woman. I quote from the magazine Socialist Woman, ghastly thought. <laughs> Socialist or woman? <laughs> Gay lib and women's lib are fighting the same oppressive ideology. <laughs> Men, I suppose. <laughs> They have common aims. <laughs> Women's liberation clearly aligns itself with what is called the new left. Young people with old ideas. <laughs> These people see society in terms of oppression groups, out to grab power and exploit the class below them. Women's liberation sees women as an, oppressive, an oppressed group within the oppressive society. And as such, it fits itself ideally into the new left philosophy. The motion tonight is that we should support this movement. Well, if you, if you accept the rigid class divisions that the new left imposes on us, if you believe their analysis of society, then perhaps you will support this motion. But remember, if you do that, you are not voting just to liberate women but you will be voting for the movement, clearly and avowedly part of what has come to be called the new left. So if you believe, so if you believe that from the family to the factory, there is a conspiracy of male capitalists whose self-interest makes them keep women in chains, then vote for this motion. But if you can see progress in the context of present society, and I think many of you will be able to, and if you can see women having wider opportunities without a revolution, and I'm sure you can, then in that case, you will throw this motion out. Mr. President, I beg to oppose. I call upon Dr. Germain Greer to speak third and in favour of the motion. Mr. President, I ought now to say either ladies and gentlemen or men and women. It strikes me as very odd that when I use the less ceremonial form of approach, I have to put the men first. <laughs> and when I affect to belong to a class of ladies and gentlemen, I put the ladies first. It must be that one class is more skilled in hypocrisy than the other. <laughs> now, when I argue here, when I argue here for your support for the women's liberation movement, I am not asking your support for the editorial board of socialist women, or woman. <laughs> I am not asking for your support for the editorial policies of a paper called Enough. I am asking you really to consider whether or not you can countenance the non-liberation of any group in your community, and whether or not you are so afraid of the characteristics and personalities of one half of the human race that you cannot allow them room to move or a voice to be heard. I am sure you are not so afraid because no one is more aware than I that women in this university did not, did not so much fight for admission to the ancient colleges and the newer upstart college <laughs> 
That admission was given them because presumably somebody considered it to be in the best interests of the colleges in question. And that somebody, God knows, was not a woman. I believe that at last men are beginning to realize where their own self-interest is best served. If you want better relationships with women, <laughs> if you want better relationships with women, you're going to have to conduct yourselves in such a way that those relationships are possible. Now I must say I have my own misgivings about the degree to which Cambridge University is capable of conducting better relations with women. <laughs> to me it would not be at all surprising if this house did not support women's liberation. In fact I'd be rather astonished to discover that this house supported anybody's liberation. <laughs> house does support women's liberation, or children's liberation, or men's liberation, or Tories' liberation, <laughs> I can only assume that it has been infiltrated by an alien group during the course of the day. A group who came because they cared more about the subject under discussion than about the ancient traditions of this establishment which has allowed itself to become an entertainment society like the Village Glee Club. to belabor this point because it's so damned parochial and because so many people just wouldn't believe what kind of a high school this really is. <laughs> now when I was in Cambridge I occupied the... I'm sorry sir, do you have an objection? Yeah, not an objection, just a point of information ma'am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> during your days uh, I believe that the colleges or the women's colleges were closed at about 8.30. Now, how old do you think I am? <laughs> May I give you a point of information, you sir? We were allowed visitors until 11, oh, and as no. far as I know, sexual intercourse can take place at any hour of the day. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether that point was material, but something in your look gave me to suspect <laughs> of course special leave for the May balls. In fact, nobody got home at all at night during the May ball. There was a point of information, madam, and hadn't quite started. Because, it's... <laughs> because you got the first bit wrong. <laughs> if you'd like to get to the second bit, we might have been able to... Do oh, you, you take see... the second bit? That's a jolly decent on man. <laughs> That I believe that in the days where Mrs. Pancras, sorry, Miss Pancras. Uh, and Pancras, there was not Chris Pancras, yes, right. <laughs> or Pancreas. <laughs> Madam, I'm enjoying the Battle of Wits, but I'd like to get to the point of information. Wits, people. <laughs> what I'm really driving at is the fact that when I was. At Cambridge, I was aware that there was a fantastic amount of sexual tension in this community. Now, I'm not talking in, in news of the world terms. I know better, because I'm a university teacher and an, a graduate of three universities, I know better than to say... I don't regard it as a distinction. It's such a common thing. The thing I'm about to say is that... I know perfectly well that what the fevered imagination of the editorial board of the News of the World dictates is not true. There is not unlimited sexual activity throbbing behind the walls of this Augustus institution. I agree with you entirely that it's a shame. I don't come here to get laid, sir. Has it ever occurred to you, Miss Greer, that one thing men do like is intellectual arrogance like you're showing? <laughs> think that if I am so defensive I have to tell you that I'm not speaking of just one university but three that this demonstrates arrogance I rather thought it demonstrated paranoia I'm sorry if my 
speech so far has indicated nothing but intellectual arrogance. It is too much the inheritance of my education that I should show a good deal of intellectual arrogance. But I hope that some plain speaking would emerge from it as well. And I'm a little tired of the common myths that are being peddled about our situation as women in universities. And these are what I want to sort out a little bit. Every woman at this university is faced with the dilemma of absorbing a system of values which is inimical to any tradition that her sex have established on their own behalf. Now this may not be as great a setback as it seems. When I was here studying, I used to attend a class given by Dr. Leavis. And whoever thinks that Cambridge has become a mediocre place usually makes some sort of an exception for Dr. Leavis, either on the grounds that he's better than mediocre or worse than mediocre. <laughs> But we seem to be agreed that mediocre he is not. All that I know about English criticism was taught by Leavisites and imbibed eventually by me at his knee, literally in his house in Bulstrode Gardens. Now I remember Dr. Leavis talking about Virginia Woolf and the chief burden of his criticism was that Virginia Woolf was a woman <laughs> and a suicide. And every sentence she ever wrote contained irrefutable evidence that she was both female and suicidal. <laughs> and I learnt, as well as I could, to trace down this defect in ego, this defencelessness, this helplessness in Virginia Woolf, and to punish it as a defective style. I never understood that what I was looking at was part of the pathology of oppression part of the curious way in which a woman in her situation educated herself to be a writer and then was a writer in this curious, unreal situation of a woman protected by a man from those very contacts with the outside world that should have been the lifeblood of her art, which it may even be true she was incapable of receiving because too damaged before she ever began. Now most of this is speculation, is problematical. But what was not problematical was that I, as a woman, was trained to be the most unsparing critic of my own tradition. So I was left, as an intellectual, somehow unprovided, somehow more identified with a scheme of values which I could not translate into justification of my own sex's battered and defective contribution to a culture which only allowed them to participate in a curious way. This intellectual dilemma is of the most serious. It's the kind of intellectual dilemma that makes women drown themselves, that makes them put their heads in gas ovens, that makes them tear up their best poems and refuse to show them to people. To be without a tradition is about the most dreadful deprivation that an artist can, can possibly undergo. It's up to the artist whether he decides to revolt against it, to condescend to it, to reject it in every way. But he needs it. He needs to know that there are channels in which he may proceed if he wishes. To have to dig your own channel is like a man running in a blindfold race who doesn't know if he isn't just running in entirely the wrong direction and the goal escapes him altogether. When we talk about women's liberation, all the women's liberation movement, which the opposition has falsely defined as the editorial board of various newspapers, which he happens to have read, when we are talking about the women's liberation movement, we are talking about an impetus arising from the whole of our society, an impetus as old as our culture, which is at last moving into an area in which it can realize its most noble aspirations. Because it is now possible to control birth without risking life and destroying morality, because it is now possible to reorganize our industrial structures away from the importance of physical strength and towards the importance of dexterity and application and goodwill, because these things are possible, it is now possible for the heartfelt cry of women who are not my grandmother or my great-grandmother, women whose lines have extinguished long ago, it is now possible for what they argued for to be realized. And if it is realized, the result must be a better life for us all. And I don't mean more comfortable because God knows for the first two generations it won't be.
for the first several generations it won't be because we had an enormous intellectual weight upon our shoulders we have to invent a way of life which was never before possible but at least we can argue in the true sense of better that we have a more moral existence when women act out of free choice when they contract themselves to people out of free choice when they produce work which is their best when they are able to face criticism, when they have enough intellectual and spiritual muscle not to break down and be hidden by uxorious husbands from the pressure of cultural examination. I am not talking to this audience as I would talk to those of my sisters who are working in factories, which seems to be thought by the opposition would be an innovation. He apparently has not heard that one in three married women in this country are at work, and most of them in menial occupations. One in three married women in this most wonderful of all worlds. I am not talking to you as I would talk to those women who have more to teach me about being a woman than I know, because I have always been a kind of remittance man. I have always been a privileged escapee from my own sex. It's true that I've been given the strange booby prize of being regarded a lesbian or a maniac or something of the sort. But distinguished women, however distinguished, either by the accidents of the bookselling industry or whatever, have always been regarded as sexual deviants. It's an easy way out of having to consider them as a possibility among the rest of women who have not been allowed to develop so. I speak to you then as a female escapee, as a traitor, as a white Negro who has learnt the values of my oppressor and knows how to apply them. You too are in a similar situation. We can only redeem ourselves and justify our privilege if we agree to work for the vast majority of women, including most of our mothers, most of our sisters, most of our cousins, and possibly, given the inexorable ebb and flow of the situation, our daughters as well. Unless we can work for those women, we cannot have dignity because we are here as escapees and remittance women. And I ask you to opt for nothing less than an exploding future into full adulthood and full moral responsibility. Mr. William Buckley, Jr., to speak for and against the motion. Thank you very much, oh, Mr. President, Ms. Greer, Mr. Goyda, Mr. Alcock, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here. I'm grateful for your invitation. I'm grateful for the experience of listening to the <coughs> predecessor speakers from whom I learned a great deal. I'm grateful to Mr. Are you sure? I was telling, I was giving a list of everyone I was grateful to, you know. <laughs> yeah, I haven't missed anything yet. <laughs> I'm, of course, um, here as an advocate, as is Miss, Miss Greer, uh, whose uh, brilliance uh, is perhaps the principal uh, asset of, of her movement. However, I do, I do uh, hope you will understand if I say it quite bluntly, that I would not uh, have wasted uh, your time uh, or uh, spent a great deal of my own if my burden here tonight was to oppose for women the room to move, to quote Miss Greer, uh, a voice to be heard, to quote again Miss Greer, 
I do not remember ever having opposed uh, educational opportunities for women, or for that matter, industrial uh, or political uh, opportunities for women. And Ms. Greer is quite collect, uh, correct in her insight that it is inconsistent with my, my general position to do uh, anything of the sort. We, we are here to debate not women's uh, liberation, but as Mr. Alcock reminded us, the women's uh, liberation movement. And those who do not allow uh, an important distinction between the two terms do not, uh, for instance, allow a distinction between uh, a fight against uh, uh, poverty uh, and a movement uh, against uh, poverty that is led by representatives of, of an ideological uh, creed. Miss, uh, Miss, Miss Greer, you understand, uh, is not always easy to follow, in part because she tends to, to contradict uh, uh, herself. Those of, you, those of you who have read her extraordinary uh, book, so, so uh, uh, rich in, in scholarship and ingenuity uh, and uh, in insight, and I'm not being uh, in the least sarcastic, Will. <laughs> will, however, uh, uh, emerge with certain uh, schizophrenic difficulties because uh, uh, half of it is devoted to the thesis uh, that uh, there are no differences between uh, men uh, and women and the other half, though it, it is not, a, uh, it is not uh, the first half versus the second half. The, car the uh, paradox is spliced uh, uh, through. Uh, and the other, the other is devoted to the notion that uh, 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 in fact, men uh, and women are significantly uh, are different. You are, you are, of course, familiar. It is, I suppose, it is, I suppose, the, the original uh, charge against male chauvinism, a word which begins to cloy on the other side of the Atlantic, as I hope it begins to, to cloy here, uh, based on, on the exploitation of sex by, by, by men. Uh, it seems to me, however, uh, altogether uh, plain uh, that uh, Miss Greer, who knows, understands uh, her theatrical uh, resources, uh, has very definitely uh, exploited uh, a sex in the course of attempting to shock people into a recognition of the women's liberation uh, movement. I cannot understand any obvious reason for her serving as a contributing editor to a magazine called a Suck, of which uh, a magazine she was recently uh, questioned about by a journalist who said to her, you must have noticed that among other things, your magazine contains pictures of young children uh, locked in sexual embrace, women uh, copulating with machines, homosexuals penetrating each other while wearing Nazi uniforms and references to people being forced to eat and drink uh, human waste, to which uh, she replies, I don't approve of that kind of thing. But on the other hand, uh, on, the, on the other hand, she says, uh, she says that's the way things are, are, and she does not desire to censor them out of her uh, own magazine, uh, putting forward, therefore, a definition uh, of censorship uh, as leaving out things from your uh, own uh, paper, irrespective of your, your position towards them. Yes, yes, Ms. Green. One of the editors, and my uh, association with them has been truncated as of 10 days. I congratulate you, and I thank you. <laughs> I find that, Mr. President, a very optimistic uh, datum about women's uh, liberation. <laughs> uh, 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 Miss, Miss. <laughs> well, <laughs> as I say, insecurity is a fact of life. <laughs> One of, uh, one of Ms. Ms. Greer's uh, uh, special uh, charms uh, is her willingness to communicate uh, the whole uh, gamut of her uh, uh, emotions to, <laughs> to, to her followers and, and also the whole gamut of her uh, vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she was asked recently, do you fall in and out of love a lot? And she replied, I think I gave up falling in love when I was about 19. 
Since then, I've allowed myself to be misled into it uh, again. And when that happens, I become absolutely abject, utterly unscrupulous, totally dishonest, and I can do nothing about it. From being an interesting and independent woman, I just become a complete pain. <laughs> I regret very much that Miss Greer is uh, out of love, but I appreciate the complimentary uh, performance uh, uh, tonight. <laughs> Miss Greer... <laughs> But, uh, but, but Miss Graham m moves on uh, on the assumption uh, that, uh, uh, that the enslavement of women is something that can only be dislodged by revolutionary means. Uh, it doesn't do at all to suggest to her that, uh, in fact, progress has been made because she says that that progress is largely illusory. She told you here tonight. She does not uh, really believe that uh, significant progress can be made because, in fact, women are locked into a relationship with men who are themselves the slave masters, who must themselves be liberated. It is impossible, she points out aphoristically, to liberate slaves without liberating uh, the slave masters. And under the circumstances, she says, that we must have nothing less than revolution. I am, if you like, uh, uh, old-fashioned about certain things in a way that I have no reason to suppose that, that you, uh, uh, you uh, are not. Uh, Miss Greer relies most heavily in her rich book, uh, full uh, of mythology, uh, full of literary uh, uh, allusion. Uh, <laughs> Sir, before we, we were discussing a political movement, I feel that it would be rather out of place to discuss this political movement in the context of some of the sexual views of the leading protagonists of this movement. Is it is not therefore rather out of place to discuss the women's liberation movement solely in terms of the political views of some of its protagonists? <laughs> Uh, if you were right, I would agree with you. <laughs> I, I, went, I went to some pains to, to establish uh, the relevance of Miss Greer's uh, uh, positions uh, to the motion here tonight. Uh, if Miss uh, Greer were an insignificant figure uh, in her movement, it would be easy to uh, uh, prescind uh, her, her own uh, views uh, from her uh, own movement, but of course uh, it isn't. In any event, you should see what I have uh, left out if you feel that I have uh, been immoderate. Miss, uh, Miss Greer herself understands uh, uh, the use of human imagery and, and, and human beings and human situations uh, in making uh, points uh, vividly. Uh, she, uh, uh, she has, uh, on, on several occasions, I felt that she could uh, most easily uh, exemplify her point uh, by, 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 in fact, citing the activity uh, of people, the failures and the, the triumphs of people, as I say, in a most uh, concrete way. She wrote in a recent essay on Norman Mailer that when she was prepared to face him in debate, the thought ran through her mind what fun it would be to accept all his thrasonical uh, challenges, and then unveil to him his own women folk, including his dark and velvety daughters, and ask them what they think of him, if only pity the curse of women would not tie their tongues. So we see several things from that passage, among them that pity is considered a curse uh, by someone who uh, is a champion of the women's liberation movement. But as I say, in conclusion, Mr. President, uh, I do feel uh, that the institutions, which I continue to understand to be the framework of, of this society, uh, have not in fact uh, uh, shown themselves to be useless. The progress that we all hope to make, not only in this field, uh, but in others, uh, can, uh, in my judgment, uh, be done in context of free institutions, in context of the family, uh, and uh, in context of many of the institutions uh, which Miss Greer uh, supposes must be tumbled before we can proceed. There are people uh, who wish in their enthusiasm for a women's liberation movement 
to take bulldozers and move down these and uh, other trees so that they can sow there the seeds of their uh, fancies. I pray that this will not happen and that you will not urge it to happen. I call on Mrs. Lavinia Grace of Girton College to speak in favour of the motion. I don't think as a married woman, woman many people, many people in this house uh, will you please address yourself to the chair? I do apologise, Mr. President. Mr. President, as a married woman... <laughs> that was last nickel, Miss Tad. <laughs> anyway, what I was going to say... <laughs> was that no one here would suspect me of being a maiden speaker. But I'm not sure that some of you might not suspect me of being unfeminine because I am a very staunch supporter of the women's liberation movement here and in America. And it does seem to many people that that movement is trying to upturn our society from the very roots. And one of the major concentrations of our society is to encourage every girl child who is born into it to conform to the feminine image. A little girl, and every little girl in this country follows this pattern as far as I know, is brought up with the primary idea that the one possible career for her in life is matrimony. She learns from a very early age to flirt with daddy, to become daddy's girl. She learns to make herself clean and tidy and to make pastry and to cook daddy's dinner and in, in short, to be exactly like mummy. <laughs> and when she gets a little older, she sees that the world laughs at, ma laughs at unmarried women, however good and kindly and intelligent they may be. She hears them called spinsters, and she sees that they are ridiculed because they have failed in their one primary female duty, that of bludgeoning some poor man into marrying them. I hate and despise and loathe beyond all words the so-called liberal 20th century attitude of men towards women. The attitude that of course they are people in their own right, that of course they should enjoy their own private sex life, which means in effect that it has become compulsory nowadays to enjoy sexual intercourse. And that because... <laughs> and because our great liberal hero enjoys being dominant, then in the course of nature, it is natural for a woman to enjoy being submissive and that she is sick or worse still, frigid, if she does not do so. Thus, in society, to be masculine is to be masterful, and to be feminine is to be servile. And so I come back to the original thesis of my speech, that men do not like unfeminine women. And that being translated means that men do not like women unless they are childish, deferring, and submissive. Mr. President, I appeal to you. <laughs> Many of them. <laughs> <laughs> I should address Point of information, it's typical of this society that my wife's name is not Mrs. Heath, but Mrs. Grace. <laughs> Perhaps I should address my question to Mr. Carter. Would you like to have been born a woman under these conditions? <laughs> And in spite of all our conditioning, even in 1972, we still have some humanity left in us, which is perhaps manifested in the women's liberation movement. <laughs> and it is only because of that humanity that we still love men, believe it or not, and perhaps some of us have stopped, but I still love men, and I think most of us do. And it is only because we love you all that we are prepared to go through with these agonizing conditions to make you love us, and honestly, wouldn't you prefer to be loved by adult women who are your equals, and with whom you can discover the possibilities of the world, and with whom an interchange of your own ideas and emotions is a possibility? 
Wouldn't you, wouldn't you prefer to be loved by a creature who is fundamentally like you in that she is a human being and only secondarily unlike you because she is a woman and who loves you not because it is only an economic necessity for her to do so but because she finds in you a compliment to herself? Would you really not prefer to love such a creature rather than the pitiful little painted doll who hasn't an idea in her head but is still resentful because she knows very well that she hasn't reached her full potential in life? Would you honestly not prefer to love a woman as she should be and have a real woman as the mother of your children? I have perhaps waxed somewhat lyrical, Mr. President. And I feel, but I do feel it had to be said, the cause of the women's liberation movement is not concerned primarily with clobbering men or with equal pay for equal work. It is concerned with allowing women to be people, with helping them to become what they should be, creatures worth loving and worth being loved by. And I don't believe anyone in this room can reject such a proposal. Mr. President, I beg to propose the motion. I call on Mr. Kevin Carey of Downing College to speak from the cross benches. Um, I would point out that if anyone wishes to interrupt Kevin, would they please stand up and I will ring my bell. <laughs> Sorry, my hands are sticky. No, move that. Sorry. So that's the, that's the television. Oh, tell it. <laughs> well, you can take the glassware, I'll knock it off. Mr. President, sir, uh, members of the House. The assertion that all human beings ought to be equal is because of the ought, a moral and a political judgment. A judgment which in the past few centuries has become increasingly acceptable in our society. On the other hand, the assertion that all men are equal is as untrue now as it has ever been. <laughs> Similarly, the assertion that women ought to have equal opportunity with men is an extension of the first thesis and is political. And the assertion that men and women are the same is an extension of the second thesis, and I'm glad it's not true. <laughs> I'm asking this House to abstain on this motion because while I support women's rights as a logical consequence of my belief in the first thesis, I do not believe the second thesis to be true. And I do not think that the women's liberation movement has approached the problem of equality of opportunity with very much sense. The assertion that all human beings ought to have... <laughs> you don't need to clap. The assertion that oh, all... Oh, ring your bell. <laughs> uh, the bell isn't working. <laughs> the bell isn't Okay, where are you? Here. Oh, good. Uh, I would merely be rather glad if you would define your parameters of equality before you start to extend them. <coughs> I thought that I expressed what I believe by equality is equality of opportunity. And I believe I made a distinction between that and being the same. <laughs> the assertion that all human beings ought to have equality of opportunity has not taken on a new dimension with the rise of the women's liberation movement. It has just been buried in rather emotive jargon which washes over from the rather subjective thought involved in the belief that men and women are, in some sense which nobody's yet defined, the same. We have all been brought up to believe that our physical makeup is affected by our psyche, so that it affects our psyche. We also know that the brains of males and females develop differently. And we also know that environment and social conditioning affect our thought. And it is the object of the women's liberation movement to change this conditioning. That change can be brought about only through political reform and through personal relations. And the example we set in personal relations, it cannot be done through slogans or through an appeal to emotions. I beg to ask this House to abstain. Thank 
And as a final speech against the motion, I call on Mr. David Holder of Corpus Christi College. <laughs> Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that it all starts about the age of four, when little girls realize that little boys have something they haven't, <laughs> and which comes in very useful at picnics. <laughs> from, this, <laughs> From this point onwards in life, a difference is defined which, as the psychosexual identity develops, becomes more and more pronounced, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> it is a basic psychological fact that men occupy the extremes in life. Criminals, mental defectives, <laughs> The best and the worst are men, not to say geniuses or, or in colour blindness. And I would like to quote, please allow me some time, Mr. President. The top rungs of the achievement ladder are certainly occupied by men. And this is very likely a basic psychological fact as opposed to a sociological one. Since the bottom rungs of this and other ladders t tend also to be occupied by men. This is from a book by Alice Heim. <laughs> Alice Heim, herself a woman. <laughs> uh, there are definite, absolute, quantifiable differences between the sexes which do controvert that there should be equality of roles. There should be equality of value in suited roles. After all, as a pretty girl once said to Sir Max Beerbohm, <laughs> women are a sex by themselves, so to speak. Thank you. The House will now proceed to a vote on the motion when the division bell is rung. Will all those who wish to vote in favour of the motion on Miss Greer's side please go out through the door marked eyes, and all those who wish to vote against the motion on Mr Buckley's side through the door marked nose. the House tonight was this House supports the women's liberation movement. There voted in favour of the motion 546 persons and there voted against the motion 156 persons. <laughs> I declare the motion carried by th a majority of 390 votes, and Miss Greer is the winner. This program was a joint production of the ATV Network Limited, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the South Carolina ETV Network, and the Southern Educational Communications Association. You have been listening to a debate between Jermaine Greer and William F. Buckley on the Cambridge Union Debating Society motion that this house support the women's liberation movement. This program was made possible with funds provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is NPR, National Public Radio.
This is NPR, National Public Radio.